fun here for a fun interactive hour. Um, I am Leah James. I am the dairy marketing manager at Gen X, um, and I'm very excited to see a room full of people excited to learn about Don Lee um, Farm Inc. Um, and just a couple housekeeping um, things. We do have some really great prizes, um, so do fill out the card um, that you sn um, snagged at the door. If you didn't, Kim in the back does have extra ones um, to get that filled out, and we'll give away a bunch of um, free goodies at the end. Um, so we will be um, virtually um, uh, taking a tour of Donley Farm. We've got a pretty fun and an interactive platform to take you through here. Um, we will be informal and take um, questions along the way if you have questions. Um, we've got the tour split into some hot spots that really focus in on the key areas of Donley Farm. Um, so with that, I'll give a quick introduction of, to um, Donley Farm. After selling their dairy in Pennsylvania in 1975, the Tabers relocated across the country to Shoshone, Idaho, where they started dairying once again in 1990 with 250 cows. Nine years later, the Tabers of Donley Farms began expanding the herd to 900 Holstein cows. Donley Farm re relies on the Gen X Herd Monitor cow monitoring system for heat detection, health monitoring, integration, and cloud-based management. The Tabers also dedicate their time to community involvement. Members of the Tabor family volunteer at fairs, have served on the Valleywide Cooper Cooperative Board for 27 years, have had several board members for Gen X over the years, and currently hold a delegate position for Gen X. They've held leadership positions on the Farm Bureau Boards, Executive Council for Lando Lakes, and the Idaho Dairy Association. Through their successful management practices and involvement in the dairy industry, it is no surprise that Donley Farms has been awarded numerous production awards for their Holstein herd in Idaho and Farmer of the Year for their county. And now, he wasn't able to join us, but we would like to turn it over for a video introduction from the owner, Don Tabor, um, to sh um, share a little bit of history about Donley Farms. <laughs> I'm Don Tabor from uh, Donnelly Farms Incorporated. We're a uh, family corporation located in Shoshone, Idaho. On the dairy here, we milk about 800 cows. Uh, we have uh, about 925 altogether. Uh, we raise all of our calves. The heifer calves, of course, are raised to go back in as replacements. All the steer calves raised in our one of our other feedlots. Cropland-wise, uh, we farm a little over 3,000 acres. Uh, raise uh, corn for the dairy, uh, all of our own alfalfa hay. We uh, raise malt barley for Anheuser-Busch, and uh, we raise sugar beets for amalgamated sugar. I grew up on a, on a small dairy farm in uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and uh, I always knew I wanted to dairy from a young age. My, my dad always had me out there helping at the barn, and uh, when I got uh, old enough to drive, drive a car and stuff. He says, you know, son, he says, I don't care what time you get in at night, milking's at five o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> that was kind of my incentive to not stay out quite all night, you know. We wanted to do the best we could. So that's why we got into genomics, and that's why we uh, used AI. And uh, maybe that's why I became a uh, director uh, for Gen X. It was because I wanted that opportunity to learn more, and to be able to uh, bring it back and uh, use some of the stuff that I was learning at uh, to the meetings and at it on my own dairy. And we've, we went from a herd of a, with about 21, 22,000 uh, uh, rolling herd average to today we're in that, we're at 29,000 pound rolling herd average. I think it's been uh, three out of the last five years we've been the number one producing herd in the state on large, a large herd, over 500 cows. And that's what motivates me. I've got to have that uh, 90 to 100 pounds of milk per cow per day, and uh, that's what makes me go. The boys kind of had to drag me into putting uh, all the automation into the parlor and everything. and. Uh, Today, I would say it's all useful tools, collars and everything. I, I just can't believe how uh, the breeder took to that so quick. We hand him a report every morning and uh, he comes in and he says, boy, I bred these three cows. He said, 
And he says, they didn't show any signs of heat at all until I uh, stuck my arm in. And he says, uh, they were uh, toned up and ready to breed. And with our other uh, uh, technology, we could pick up sick cows from the milk and parlor off of the milk weights, and uh, it would flag them for us. But not like what these collars do. Uh, uh, I'm amazed that uh, we get a list every morning, go check this cow and this cow and stuff. And uh, usually you find something. Once in a while you don't. But usually you find uh, some diarrhea or you find mastitis or you find pneumonia or something or other. But you're seeing it before, almost before the cow knows it. I, I can't run all the technology, but uh, to me it's worthwhile. Well, with that, we are very excited to be joined in person um, by Matt Tabor and Karen Fields, and I'll give a quick introduction to them, um, and they'll walk you right through the virtual tour of the operation. Uh, Matt, if you want to give a wave, is a co-owner of Don Lee Farms, Inc. He grew up on the farm and was helping uh, on the dairy since a young age of seven. Um, he's married seven years to his wife, Shirley, and they have three children, Cole, Maddie, and Hannah. Um, he has served in the USMC, uh, or ex excuse me, enlisted in the USMC upon high school graduation and actually served two combat tours in Iraq. So thank you for your service. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, Following that, he attended the University of Idaho, major, majoring in physical education and health, and he actually came back to the dairy in 2011 uh, as a truck driver, a laborer, and got into a management position as the calf manager um, and became, became part owner in um, 2020. Um, he currently manages the calf operation um, as well as designs treatment protocol for the sick in hospital pen, pens. And then Karen Fields, kind of the, the lady that is a jack of all traits, if I um, heard after um, Kristen was out there visiting. Um, she and her husband moved to Idaho in 1988. They purchased a small dairy with 200 acres just north of Shoshone. Um, she immediately enrolled in a dairy tech program offered at CSI to further knowledge of good dairy practices and operations. Um, as the dairy owner herself, she performed many duties, including relief milking, feeding IV and calves, picking raw, um, evaluating different hay for purchase and driving skid steer and tractor once again jack of all her traits yeah <laughs> um, when their youngest son was involved in a motorcycle accident um, was actually in a coma for a couple weeks and in rehab for a couple months they actually sold their dairy and concentrated on the farming operation um, she has also served at Valley Cooperative Board for more than 14 years um, while on the board that's when she met Don Tabor of Don on Don Lee Farms. Um, because of her awesome stats with um, raising um, the calves at her own operation, Don asked um, Karen to come take over the position of calf manager in the spring of 20, uh, 2001. Um, and she observed um, one day and drastically revamped the calf protocols. So she's the lady to ask. <laughs> um, in 2007, she moved to the dairy office and began, began keeping records on all the calves and the cows. Um, the breeder had been selecting sires for heifers previously, um, and now she does the sire selection um, and works with the Gen X calf program um, to make sure they have adequate replacements. So let's give a warm welcome to both Matt and Karen. And we're going to take a virtual tour of Don Lee Farm. And our first stop on our virtual tour is actually the milking parlor. Um, so I will hand the mic over to uh, Matt, and he's going to walk you through that. And Kristen will go ahead and pull that up. Thank you. And everything I, most everything I learned about calves, I actually learned from Karen, walking with her through the calves for the first little bit. She was a great teacher, great mentor. Her. Her uh, knowledge and experience with the dairy industry has been invaluable to our dairy, and we would not be where we are without her. Uh, as you all know, employees, key employees, are vital to a successful to a successful business. And I've got some of the best. Most of my guys have been around longer than I have—15, 20 years. Most of my guys have been there. I've got one milker. I grew up with all of his children. Went to high school with them. Consider them all friends. Most of my friends growing up. We're the, we're the kids of the guys that I, uh, kids of the employees. 
when you grow up on a farm, you don't get much time to get off and go hang out with your buddies from school. So you hang out with whatever kids are available. And those were the kids that I made fast friends with and uh, lifelong friends with. Uh, this is our part. This is our new parlor. Uh, we originally started with a double eight herring bone in 1990. Um, this parlor, this is the latest and greatest for our dairy. Uh, it is a double 14 parallel. As you can see, the technology up, that we have up there, uh, measure, I've got individual milk meters on all of my milking stalls, uh, automated back flush systems, automated flush systems in the barn. Dairy industry, cleanliness is godliness. So you see the venting, uh, that's all part, um, all part of our heat pump system where we take all the milk, uh, the milk goes through a heat pump. We, to cool that milk, uh, we run it through a plate cooler and we are able to, uh, let me look at my notes here. Uh, we are able to heat our water in the summertime through our heat pump and our solar system without using any energy, with any outside energy costs. Uh, we use the milk to heat the water to 100 degrees um, before we used to have a delta T, which is your, uh, that's your variable between your, wa your wash water that we need to be at 165 degrees. Uh, we used to have 100, uh, a delta T of 115. We have since been able to, with all of our technology and everything, we've been able to shrink that to 65 degrees. Uh, we, try to, we try to be as innovative and and improvise and do whatever we can to stay on top of things. Originally, this, this machine was like the latest, you know, these machines were like the latest and greatest technology. I could, buy, I could uh, monitor mastitis cows. I could catch them before my milkers could a lot of times, just monitoring conductivity levels in the milk, as well as milk production drops. All, uh, most, of my, most of my milking crew has been with us for at least 15 years. They are very well versed in what to look for. They all have extra responsibilities. You know, when we're not there in the middle of the night, they're the ones feeding my brand new calves. They're the ones pulling the calves. If we have to pull them, hopefully not. We we had uh, our original parlor burned down in 2011. We had a uh, our vacuum pump got hot. Um, it, the piping up into the attic got hot from the vacuum pump and caught the insulation on fire, which spread rapidly throughout the whole roof of the barn. Um, we were able to get everything under control, get the fire put out, and with the teamwork of all of our associates, uh, automated dairy the team the company that we use that comes in and uh, services all of our milking equipment, all of our uh, electrical equipment. Our, we had our electricians there. Fortunately, we were only down for 14 hours, which in a catastrophic time like that, when everything, when the barn's almost a total loss, only being down 14 hours is, is just phenomenally, I, I couldn't say enough about, about the team that we have associated with us. Uh, it was a blessing in disguise. It was an old barn. It was, you know, like I said before, it was originally a double eight herringbone. There wasn't a whole lot of room on the sides. We weren't really designed to get that big. Uh, we, we had retrofitted it to make it into a double 12 parallel. But there was, when, when you raise, when you raise those, uh, raised your, your gates and the cows got out, there wasn't a whole lot of room for them to leave the parlor. So now with big, with a bigger, with a bigger parlor, there's more room on the end, on, on the outside for them. They get out quicker. We cycle them through faster. The cows are a lot happier. They're a lot more comfortable. And I think that is a big re part of, that's a big part of the reason why we've been able to increase our production immensely since 2011. What is the weapons for Freestall 1? So Freestall 1, this is, this is the original barn. This was built, uh, we started construction on this back in the mid 80s. Nickel and dime here, nickel and dime there, and by 1990 we were up and running. It's seen some better days, but it's still still very functional, still very 
uh, effective for what we, we want to do. We house, uh, we house our fresh cows in there uh, up to about 45 days on one side. And then this side here that we're looking at here, these are all my first lactation, the lower end of my first lactation cows. We don't, uh, we don't really, uh, we segregate our cows differently than most dairies do. Uh, this was an old, just an old uh, timber construction. But the cows, uh, one of the amenities that we like in our barns is the cow brushes. I don't think I have a very good picture up here of, one of the cow brushes, but these cows absolutely love these brushes. They'll sit back, right back in there in the, in the holding pen there a little bit. So they will, you'll see them stop there. You'll, they'll stop there all the time. They just sit there, they'll stand there for five, 10 minutes, letting that brush just run over the back, keeps them nice and clean. The only downfall to it is the, the you know, when the breeder goes through and chocks all the cows, you know, it wipes off all that chalk. So it's kind of hard to uh, d deal with the heat detection, which, you know, the, where now this, uh, with these collars, this is where these collars come in, and they've really they've been they've been a godsend for us. This is yeah. This is our new this is our newer barn. We built this in 1999, right right before I left for the service. Um, we house about 500 head of cattle in here, four different strings. It's uh, equipped with a flush system. To help uh, in summertime, we don't try not to scrape as much as we can. Try to try not to disturb the cows as much as possible. Uh, a few years ago, we went through we retrofitted the barn. We realized our dairy animals were just—they're just getting too big. The, you know, the old genetics—that that big, strong dairy Holstein cow—just uh, wasn't. They we were having a lot of problems with injuries. So we went at, went ahead, went in, and raised up the free stalls. Raise them up all about four inches, and uh, that seemed to solve all of our problems on, on, on injuries, back injuries, and they, they've been a lot better. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention with the parlor, uh, all, all that technology is op operated through our RFID tags, the, the radio tags in the, in the ears. They come in, each, uh, each individual stall has a reader board on it that picks up that number, and that's what, that's what uh, goes back into the computer. You can see as we scroll here that right up there that's the antenna those are the antennas the receiving antennas that we use for the herd monitoring system. Uh, the pen is also equipped with some exercise pens. We've got two two groups of cows, the high producers, they get to spend all day outside if they want. Uh, summertime, good hot day like it was this day that Gen X was kind enough to come and uh, come and take a tour of our farm with us. Hot day, you won't see very many cows outside at all. The, those freestall barns, the way, it's, the way it's built, the way they're constructed, um, the airflow through them, they stay cool year round. Uh, warmth in the winter, the curtain, you, you notice the curtains on the side, they drop in the winter time or on a really windy day, we'll drop those curtains, keep the wind from blowing through there and blowing sand all over. Uh, but in the summertime, you get a nice cool breeze coming out of the west through that barn and it, it's, it, it might be 100 105 degrees outside, but you're very comfortable standing in there with your cows. So, for us, uh, we try. We're we're a very diverse dairy. Anything we can do. That's why we do a lot of. That's why we raise all of our own beef. That's why we do a lot. Of, uh, we do a lot of custom farming. Um, we try to stay as diverse as possible. Uh, reusing our manure. In places where we can get away, uh, where we can, saves a lot of money. Uh, when you're when you got a, you know, when you got a bottom line every month, you, you got to save money where you can and make money where you can. Um, we have a couple of settling ponds, pull the pull the sand and the silt out. Uh, everything uh, from the old freestall barn, we use uh, skid steer loaders to put to push the manure out into the concrete containment pit. And then with the flush system in the other barn, it pushes it from the other side into, into the pit as well. And then twice a day, we run, that, we run the separators and we get down to about, our finished product coming out of the separators is about 40% solids. Probably could be a little bit better, but it's, it's, it's working for us. Uh, all, the, all the liquid then goes, uh, that's siphoned off of the separating system is then brought out to these lagoons. And with the two with the two fields in the back there, uh, we will take 
we will pump that water through another, through another separator in the back and take a little bit more solid off of if we can. But we pump the lighter liquids onto these two pivots uh, as fertilizer. And then the heavier stuff that settles to the bottom, we will pump that out once or twice a year and spread that, on, spread that out on our other fields. For us, uh, for Idaho, there's, there's a lot of talk about you know, phosphorus usage. Uh, that we generally plant two crops a year on these pivots. We start out, we'll start out with triticale as a cover crop in the spring, harvest that for heifer silage, and then follow right in, right behind it with, uh, with, with silage corn to help utilize more of that phosphorus. Um, we're not so much worried about the nitrogen in the soil. The phosphorus is definitely a lot, a lot bigger issue for us. Uh, you're limited, and I, I might be nationwide, but Idaho, we're limited to 45 parts per million on phosphorus in the soil. So, so utilizing crops that can that can pull that, that pull that phosphorus out uh, is able to keep us going and let it, let us reuse everything. Uh, all the solids that come from that come off of the separators, we truck it out to another lot. Uh, you kind of saw it on the on the broad overview. Down here in the lower left-hand corner, pretty hard to see, but we just truck it out, dump it right out here on, on the hard-packed sand, and we let it compost naturally. We go uh, once, twice a week. We're out there at the loaders, turning it, keeping it, uh, getting it to dry out as much as we can, and then all that, all that compost when it's when it's finally done composting, we'll bring that back into the free stalls and use it as bedding. And it's, and it's a great way. It's a great way to re uh, reduce and reuse. All of it. All of it. Yep. 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 And then, and then periodically, uh, we get uh, with the sugar company we sell our sugar beets to. They uh, one of the byproducts they have is a, it's a lime dirt, and we will come back in and uh, we'll, we'll come in with that lime dirt. We use that lime dirt to refill our, our exercise pens when we when we clean them up. We also will put it in the freestall barn as bedding periodically, just to just to use that lime to help neutralize that. The dirt in there and keep and, and uh, help keep our mastitis levels down. And then all uh, everything from our hospital barn and uh, our old the old cows, the old crippled cows. They they all stay. They lay on basically an open lot with uh, lots of straw. That's over by that's that corral over by the maternity pen. Um, that's all gathered up and uh, we'll spread that as well in the spring and the fall. Whatever whatever pivots it's, it's due to get it. You'll have to excuse me, I'm not going to stand up. Um, our maternity pen, actually, you have to start with your dry cows. Cows are dried spring, summer, fall, go out to pasture, a large pasture that has a stream running through it and a water trough with plenty of trees for shade. At about three weeks prior to calving, they get moved to a close-up pasture pen where they are checked at least once a day, probably twice a day. Anybody that's bagging up then, of course, gets moved to our maternity pen up at the dairy, where anyone walking by will be able to look at them and see whether they're in the process of calving or not. If it's a started calving, we'll move them into an individual calving pen that has a head catch for it for the safety of the cow and the handler. We try to let them calve on their own, but if not, then we do have the ability to lock the cow up. Once the cow has calved and the calf is clean, the cow gets moved to a fresh pen where she will stay anywhere from two days to 10 days in this pen, depending upon what her condition is. We will heat temp every cow, take their temperature physically for 10 days, whether they're in this fresh pen or in a fresh transition pen. By doing this, we can monitor their temperature and catch anything that is going on of whether it's a retained, a metritis, a pneumonia. They are physically examined for 10 days. Cows that are bagging up will get looked at in the computer to determine whether they are 
actually an overbreed or whether they're right on schedule. Yeah, young stock. Any questions on the maternity pen area? Otherwise, Matt's going to walk us through the young stock. Um, uh, how would you use those columns and on? These are my babies. This is the next generation on our farm. Uh, when, when calf is born, we, uh, winter time, spring time, uh, late fall, when, when things get cold, I've got, I've got a, I've been blessed with some beautiful facilities. Uh, this is my milk house right here. Um, we bring them in when, when, it, when it's too cold, we put them outside when I don't feel comfortable putting them outside because of, because of the weather. We bring them in, we get them dried off, get them warmed up. This is where I'll process them in here. This is, it also doubles as my, as a hospital facility for me. Uh, if I have down calves, if I have calves that are really struggling, I bring them in here, get them on an IV. Um, most of my doctoring I do right in the pen, but if, but if, but if they need extra help, ex, extra care, then we bring them in so I can monitor them. We feed, we feed twice a day. Um, there is no, there really isn't any difference between my calves inside the solar barn here and my calves in the outside hutches. We just, it's just a, it's kind of a snake system. Wherever, whatever pen's opened up next, whatever group of calves is uh, weaned next, that's where the next group of calves goes. Uh, I, like the, I like the solar barn for my own personal creature comforts, but as far as calf care is concerned, I would much prefer on, on the calf end of things. My calves outside and the individual hutches are far healthier on, on a general basis, just because they've got more space. You know, we've learned a lot here in the last year and a half about you know social distancing, that sort of thing. So you get, <laughs> Farmers, we've known about we've known about this distancing thing a lot longer than most people. But as far as being able uh, the, for the quickness of care in the morning, it, I, I can zip through these calves. I look at every calf at least twice a day. Um, I feed we feed uh, for the first 14 days. I feed three quarts, three quart bottles, and then we supplement with free choice water and free choice calf starter as well as I push a lot of electrolytes. I do have, uh, no matter what I do on my dairy farm, I've been having a scouring problem for years. That is my, big, that is my biggest uh, hurdle to get across as far as getting my calves raised. And so trying to keep these calves hydrated as best I can, especially in the summer months, because we get, we get really hot, but this solar barn stays pretty cool. You get a, uh, I've got pretty good airflow in there. Uh, we spray spray it consistently for flies. Flies are always a big issue end of August, first part of September. I know my dairy is not the only one. These are my outside hutches. We feed, I, uh, if, after 14 days, I bump them up to about a gallon of milk per feeding. Uh, my older my older calves yet that are right before they're weaned, they're getting a little bit more than that. I try I try to put as much weight on them as possible before before they wean. Uh, my calf feeder, uh, same calf, she's been with me for 10, 11 years, and she is another one of my invaluable employees because uh, she's she takes she loves the calves, she treats them like they're her own, and she's got she. She's like the mom, I, I, I always tease her a little bit. I like to have fun with my employees. I say, hey, you're, you know, you're the mom now. You know, you're the mom for all these babies. And she, she takes care of them. She watches over them. If, if, she think, if, if ever she's got any issues with a calf, if she doesn't think it's drinking right, hey, come take a look at this calf for me real quick. We have very good communication back and forth, which is very key to keep, keeping these calves going. Because a lot of times she might see something that I miss. And I don't take that lightly. You know, if somebody sees something, they got they got to come let me know, so we can get on top of it right away. I can't save every calf, but I can sure as heck try. At two months of age, just because that's about all the that's about all the longer I've got the room for to uh, before they cycle through the pens again. Uh, I wean I wean them, and we put them back here in these group pens in the back. I like to keep my pens at about 10 calves per pen. I, I try not to keep anything overcrowded as much as possible. And they stay, they'll stay back here, uh, they'll stay back here for about a month, three weeks to a month, just depending on how fast I'm, how, 
how fast I'm running through the calves. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's a little, little less time. But then once we leave, once we get out of these pens, uh, we'll feed them. We feed them hay, calf starter here again, and uh, mix in some uh, rumen supplement or you know, uh, rumen builders and stuff like that. And then I, then from here, this is when we start to segregate the calves. Uh, my two big pens in the back over there. They're, one pen is uh, designated for my beef heifers and all and all of my steers and bull calves. I do raise a few bull calves. I don't keep many. I like to keep one. I like to keep one, uh, at least one bull for my clean, you know, to clean up all my pregnant heifers just in case something, some somebody slips a calf. Uh, and then I sell a few bulls to another dairy. But most of what we do, 99% of what we do is AI. Especially in the, uh, and then when you get into the dairy herd, it's 100% AI. And then the other pen is my dairy heifers. My, We've got, uh, I've got a nice selection of mo mostly Holsteins, but I do, got, I, I do have a few of those nice little, cute little Jersey heifers that, that all the little girls like, especially my daughter. My two, da my two daughters, their favorite thing to do is come up to the barn with me to help me give paste, to, you know, give the probiotic paste to the calves. They call it the yum yums, because it's a, it's a good palatable microbial paste to help with the scours. And my girls have started calling it yum yums. Gotta give the calves their yum yums. So feeding, so we have a dedicated dairy nutritionist. Uh, we've been using standard dairy nutrition for probably 15 years, longer than any other nutrition company we've ever had. I used to, I, I used to tease my dad about changing nutritionists more often than he changed his underwear. But standard nutrition has been very good to us. They are on top of everything. They. Uh, our, our nutritionist, Mitch Deer, he is out here weekly. He meets with us, look, looks at all, looks at our records, looks how much uh, we use the Easy Feed program. The Easy Feed program has been has has worked wonders for us as far as being able to save on the amount of feed that that we waste. Uh, all of our push out feed, the excess push out feed that we take from the dairy cows, we'll refurbish that and run it, uh, feed it to our heifers too. Whatever whatever the dairy cows won't finish. Twice a week, we pull that feed back out and uh, feed it through our heifers. Uh, we feed a lot of uh, feed a lot of triticale silage to the heifers, along with a little bit of corn silage. Uh, we raise all of our own hay. Usually, usually, we get four cuttings. This year, we didn't have any water. We most of our hay we only got one cutting off of. Welcome to Southern Idaho. Like some, like I heard, overheard somebody saying earlier. It's all high desert, but the many, the, but the many you put a little water to it, the ground turns into the Garden of Eden. Every year, every year we'll chop about 10,000 ton of corn silage and put it on the pits. Uh, one of the nicest things we ever did, I'm glad we did it, it makes handling the feed a lot easier in the wintertime when things get wet and soggy with all the snow. As we paved, we, we, put, we paved a great big pad out here with, with asphalt. And that's what we try to keep all the dairy feed, the, the cows for, uh, the feed for all the dairy cows on this. Along, so, and then we feed, uh, our, our total mixed ration that we feed is corn silage, haylage, and then uh, mostly ground corn with, uh, with, with our mineral package and uh, cotton seeds, soy, uh, soy best, and canola mixed into it. But the nice thing, the the nice thing about the Easy Feed program is you can. It's taken a lot of time, you know. Before you had we we had a sheet of paper that you had to look at. Okay, I need 1,500 pounds of this, 2,000 pounds of this. Now it's all plugged right in. Now it's all plugged right into the scales of the of the feed truck. So, so instead of having to do that math in my head, now it's all right there for me, and it saves me saves a lot of time, you know, getting the getting the feed out. We, we run, we run uh, we'll, the program we are on, we run four loads of feed a day. My dad starts things off 4.30 every morning, like clockwork, he is at the barn. My dad is a rock star, he's 74 years old, he's still the first one to the barn in the morning and the last one to leave at night. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to take a sick day 
when you look over and you see and you see your dad just out there killing it every day still just working circles around you but that's the work ethic that we've grown up with that's every every one of us uh, there's um, myself and my brother my older brother Darren we're, we're still on the farm my oldest brother he is he's got his own farm but we're all the same way we all get up first thing in the morning and we don't stop until the end of the day when when the work is done uh, but we start at 4.30 in the morning feeding cows, and the last load of feed is usually run off about 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. And we all, we all take turns. We've all got, we all have to take our, our turn feed, doing that barn check at night, that last check of the day. Because everybody knows that's when all your problems happen when nobody's left on the, left on the farm. So, so the way we group our cows, of course we have our fresh pen. Uh, we go from our, our close-up pen. Uh, once they calve, they get kicked over to the fresh pen, and from there we put, we put, uh, they stay there about two to five days until, until we know that they're, uh, they can get into a bigger pen. Uh, we'll, hold them in, uh, we'll hold them in a fresh string until about 45 to 50 days, and then we push them out into, the, into our other strings uh, one pen uh, on freestall one is my low, like I said earlier, is my low producing first lactation heifers. I have uh, one pen in, my, in the big barn is my high producing first lactation heifers. And then I have one pen dedicated solely to second lactation cows, second and uh, young third lactation cows if, I, if I'm running out of room. But I try, we try to keep them grouped by age and size. That, you know, that way you don't, you don't have to deal with the bullying as much. Uh, and then I have my high producing cows and uh, my old, then a group of older cows that are usually fourth and fifth lactations, sixth, seventh lactation. I've got one old girl that gets to, she's gonna, she's gonna get to die on the farm. She's, uh, she's old enough to drive. She's 13 lactations. She does her job every day. She still gets up every morning and go, walks right into the barn. When we started, it was funny. We started the, when we started these herd monitoring collars. You know, she her 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 collar came up every single day. Well, she's old. She lays around all day. I don't blame her. Our beef on dairy program, we use a, a, a Gen X calf math program. Our lowest net milk cows all get bred automatically to beef. Our Holstein steers and beef crosses, we raise them to finish weight and they're shipped directly to Tyson. We do not get any difference in the price for heifers or steers, particularly if they have a black hide. We use Angus semen for this reason because Tyson does give us a quality bonus for the black hide. On our genetics, we've been doing genetic testing since 2014. We breed all heifers to three services of sex semen and then we go directly to the beef semen. Our first and second lactation cows get bred two services of sex semen and then back to beef. Third lactation cows get bred straight to beef. We do not want to continue that genetics in our herd because we feel that our younger stock has better genetic potential than the older stock. On my sire selection, I noticed quite early on that the cows were getting too big and I mentioned it to Don and I started pulling in cows with a lesser stature and going to a zero or a negative figure to correct this problem. We use the highest net merit possible that are, is in our parameters for our sex semen. Right now our net merit for a sire has to be 975 minimum. We breed for net merit, small stature, high combined, high combined fat and protein. The fat and protein has to be 150 or better. 
I breed for a positive DPR and a positive feed saved. Since genomic testing started in 2014, our herd average, again, was mentioned, was 83 pounds per cow per day on two times a day milking. Right now, our herd average for 2020, I use complete fiscal years, is 91.2 pounds, which is an increase of 1.4 pounds of milk per animal per year. Our fat average is 3.9%. Our protein average is 3.17. We are starting to have heifers hit the ground that we have genomic tested that are testing out at an 800 plus net merit. Our low net merit heifers, because we have no market for heifers in, our, in Idaho, we're on a quota basis for fat, protein, and other solids. Net merit heifers that are less than 400 are going directly to the fat pen. We are not breeding them at all. Our heifer breeding age starts at 14 months. Voluntary cow waiting age is 60 days. We breed all of our animals off of a herd monitor system. Our veterinarian does go through and check them, but he would many times come in and say, well, Karen, I would not have bred this cow, but she was on the list. I checked her, and yeah, she's 22 days since she was last bred. We would not have caught that cow as not being pregnant if we hadn't have had this system because it catches them. Otherwise, we would have gone to a herd health check and the vet would have called her, said open, and would have said, okay, where's her net merit? Where is she in our herd? Do we want to breed her again? Do we want to resync her and go through all the expense of resyncing an animal and trying to get her pregnant? This way, we're catching them at between 19 to 22 days after the breeding cycle if they're not pregnant. Our heat palpitation pregnancy rate has increased from approximately 60% to 85% because we're getting those animals rebred before they ever hit the vet check. As I said, our breeder's attitude is very positive with this system because he comes in, he, I get a list of every cow that's in heat from the herd monitor. I get a list that says, hey, this cow should be pregnant. He also will check the pregnant cows if they're on the list but showing a heat, he'll check them, let me know if they're pregnant or not. If they're not pregnant, he will go ahead and breed them to whatever we have down for her sire. And uh, we do have a, just a quick um, video that we wanted to share. Um, the um, Gen X representative out at Don Lee is um, Justin Pregitzer. Um, it works very closely with the herd on the repro and the genetic side of things. Um, and so he'll just talk a little bit about the benefits they've seen since they've implemented the system. My name is Justin Pregitzer. I'm a territory sales manager for Gen X in Southern Idaho. Uh, I get to work with Donley Farms and we've had lots of really good conversations about what, what kind of goals they want to work on in the future and, and heat detection came up in, in some of those conversations and so we started talking about activity monitors and getting some data back from some of the other farms and what they're experiencing sounded very appealing to, to Donley. So they decided to go ahead and do it and we, we've had it in for a little while now and what we're starting to see is they are actually breeding more cows than they had been before. The breeder has noticed that he he's not getting all the silent heats that he thought he might have been. Uh, another thing that's really nice that this system allows us to do is when the breeder's finished breeding for the day at the farm, he goes and finishes his route, and then he has the opportunity to come back if there's a cow that came into heat a few hours later. So they're getting to take advantage of a little bit bigger window for breeding, and uh, the breeder's really been enjoying it because he's, he's getting more cows bred and, uh, and he's very excited about it, so it's been very positive. Another thing that, that 
we were really surprised to see with this herd monitor was it's finding sick cows much faster than the the farm was before and so it gives them a list every single day of the cows that need some attention and so the employees are able to go track those cows down and diagnose them and figure out what what's the next steps to take and they're finding some cows are catching 24 hours before they, they ever would have and they're even finding some cows that they get to and they don't know exactly how to treat them because they still look healthy but obviously the ruminations drop, so something's going it's, on. It's putting some excitement behind Repro now because we're, we're really looking forward to the results and, and, and improving, and, and there's, there's a lot of excitement around Repro now because this system allows us to have a lot more information to use in real world. And, and we're starting to see the beginning uh, pregnancy checks, their, their palp rates going up. We're seeing their their heat detection starting to climb. Uh, so it's, it's becoming very exciting. But for me as a Gen X person is I'm able to see their information remotely. And so when, when they have a question, uh, I'm able to log on on my computer, look at their exact same screen, and I can I can see exactly what they're seeing. So we can look into one cow and, and, and say, look, this is this is what she's doing for today. Or I can I can help walk them through any any kind of questions that they've got. Uh, I can also do that on my cell phone. So I've, I've been able to pull over and, and, and pull it up on my cell phone and, and see exactly what they're seeing and, and figure out what our next steps need to be on how, how to address some of these situations. One of, the, one of the next steps that we're looking forward to being able to, to take is after we get comfortable with breeding behind the systems, what, what we can do to adjust our, our synchronization program because we're thinking that, that that group of cows is going to get smaller and uh, once we're, we're really confident in breeding behind the system, we're, we're going to make some tweaks to our synchronization program as well. So with that, I hope you felt like you had boots on the far, or boots on the ground and Shoshone, Idaho. Let's give a really nice round of applause for Matt and Karen as they walked us through. Uh, and we will um, field some questions here, but I did want to take an opportunity to really quickly introduce um, Hoob um, to plot. He is the CEO of GenX, and um, GenX is a sponsor here of this webinar, and just wanted to give a quick shout out to Hoob. And John Rudiner joined as well. He is actually the council president for the cooperative, so thanks for coming. And then we also have a NEDAP expert in the back, um, Tara Boner there. She is um, available for questions on the systems. And we have a question right here here in the front so thank you for asking a question we got a prize for question answer so let's see what question do you have what is the average age of your milking herd average age of the milking herd well obviously you know, some of these cows, you know, we want, we want to keep these cows, you know, last year we had our first 200 pound cow and she is now a fifth lactation cow. But, you know, obviously, you know, as I said, you know, we have that, we got that old girl out in the hospital pen, you know, all she does is feed a calf a day now, but, you know, um, as long as they keep, as long as they keep breeding back, you know, it's like the old dairy, you know, it's like the old dairyman that, you know, well, that cow looks ugly. Why do you keep her around? She's bred. So, but probably the average, I, I would have to say the average age of our, of our herd is probably in a third lactation. So about that six, six to seven year mark. Fifth lactation, yeah. Okay, Another question here in the front. Okay, question is what age are you starting to breed your heifers? Karen reports 13.9 to 14 months is the average um, age of the heifers getting bred. Yep, question in the back there. Uh. What's the uh, pregnancy rate per cycle you're getting? <laughs> Pregnancy rate per cycle. What are what are you? Well, yeah. What are you? Can, can I? Yep. Two point one services per conception. We got to get a prize back there, Kristen. Question here. At what age are you starting to put the collar system? 
So, yep, just to repeat the question, uh, the question was at what age are you putting the collars on, the herd monitor collars on? We do that when we process the heifers. The cows all have collars. Uh, when we bring the heifers and cows in for processing at three weeks prior to calving, any heifer that comes in gets a collar at that time and is recorded in the computer. And um, Karen? And just to follow up, you guys do, you mentioned that you pasture, and so um, you do, they are able to get readings on the, 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 mo the monitors out in the pasture, too, on those. Sorry, uh, the, the dry cow pasture that we have our dry cows on is about 200 acres. And so getting a getting an antenna up that'll reach the whole stretch, you know, we got is uh, a little challenging at the moment. Um, now in the winter time when we bring them in, when the, uh, when the water goes off and we don't have any water left put on that pasture anymore, uh, we do have we do have some antennas down at our other down at our feedlot where we'll bring those dry cows in for the winter and we'll be able to monitor them a lot closely down there. But usually, you know, the dry cows, they're, they're a little less, you know, they're a little less hands-on. So we don't need to monitor them as closely. I mean, we're still out there. We're still out there every day, walk, you know, walking through them, riding through the cows. Uh, once a week, we go out and uh, bring, in, bring in the next week, you know, and the cows that are due to be processed in the next week. And so, you know, and then, uh, of course, the pipe movers, everybody, you know, everybody watches. Everybody's got an, eye, got an eye on the cows, and 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 they may not be. It may not be their first responsibility to check that to check a cow. But if they see a cow that just does, if, if they see something that just doesn't look right, you know, it's the old adage: you see something, you say something. So the question is: um, the RFID tags, um, in addition to the collars. So we start. We started with the RFID tags about the same time. Um, well, no. Well, it's been a lot longer than that. We've been, we've been using the RFID system since before we moved into the new barn. Um, the nice thing about the RFID tags, for whatever reason, our herd of cows does not take well to the to the metal bangs vaccination tag that they get. They always fest for whatever reason. Twenty five percent of our herd always festers up. And you get nasty growth coming out of the, from those tags. This was a way to replace it. It's also a way for me to go down through, you know, when I'm doing a herd, a herd check with the veterinarian, I've got, I've got a handheld palm reader that I can pull up all the records on. I've got a wand, I will go up, I, I you know, zap that cow quick, pull it up. I've got everything I need to know right there on that cow, just from that tag. And it's, 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 it's a multi, you know, it's a, it's a you know, it's a multifunctional tag that, that, that's, um, it's also, it also serves, you know, we're a 100% registered herd. So that tag also serves as their registration number. That, that, that RFID that, when I enter that RFID when they're a calf, because they get, they get that RFID put in their ear that very first day, that number follows them for their, li for their whole life cycle. I think there's a question in the back here. Uh, yes, what is your question? Uh, so I was wondering, do you use sexed beef semen or just conventional beef semen? Sure, great question. So the question in the back was whether um, you guys are utilizing sexed beef semen or just sexed um, dairy semen. The reason why is because Tyson does not give any different bonus between heifers or steers on the fat stock. 
only if it's a black hide. Uh, another, uh, if I can piggyback off that a little bit, uh, another reason uh, the market, it seems the market is not quite there yet. I, 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 I imagine as I look at, as I look into the future, I think beef on dairy, I think you're going to see a lot. I, I imagine you'll eventually see a lot more sexed male, uh, sexed male semen. Uh, the, the semen we use is uh, about 90, it's supposed to be 75 to 90 percent for heifers. And we're running about 90 to 95 percent heifers with, 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 those, with those sex semen uh, sires. Yep, question right here in the red. Matt, just switching gears from you away from uh, the breeding and uh, the cow management side. Your bedding coming out of your uh, freestall barn, did I hear the right that 100% uh, of your sand is being reclaimed and going back in? Is that pretty typical for uh, you know a dairy as far as with a separator or is that pretty common? So you're betting with straight sand. I mean, you don't have to blend. Additional questions for Matt or Karen. Kim, let's pull for some prizes. Okay, yes, yeah, so she'll make her way up to the front. We've got some more prizes to hand out. Um, quick um, uh, shout out to Kristen Brogy, a Gen X event manager. She kind of manned the electronics behind uh, the scenes, so we sure appreciate her help. Um, Kim is helping me, Kim, Dr. Kim Egan, also from Gen X, um, a DVM that we are lucky to have as a key consultant in the greater Wisconsin area. Um, so yes, please do put your cards in the basket. Um, we'll pull for some more prizes here. Um. Oh yes, yeah, so yes, we do have a grand prize. Yeah, so um, we have...